Chapter One of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter One. Motives to the present work. Reception of the author's first publication. Discipline of his taste at school. Effect of contemporary writers on youthful minds. Bowles's sonnets comparison between the poets before and since pope it has been my lot to have had my name introduced both in conversation and in print more frequently than i find it easy to explain whether i consider the fewness unimportance and limited circulation of my writings or the retirement and distance in which i have lived both from the literary and political world most often it has been connected with some charge which i could not acknowledge or some principle which i had never entertained nevertheless had i had no other motive or incitement the reader would not have been troubled with this exculpation what my additional purposes were will be seen in the following pages it will be found that the least of what i have written concerns myself personally i have used the narration chiefly for the purpose of giving a continuity to the work in part for the sake of the miscellaneous reflections suggested to me by particular events but still more as introductory to a statement of my principles in politics religion and philosophy and an application of the rules deduced from philosophical principles to poetry and criticism but of the objects which i proposed to myself it was not the least important to effect as far as possible a settlement of the long continued controversy concerning the true nature of poetic diction and at the same time to define with the utmost impartiality the real poetic character of the poet by whose writings this controversy was first kindled and has been since fuelled and fanned in the spring of seventeen ninety six when i had but little past the verge of manhood i published a small volume of juvenile poems they were received with a degree of favour which young as i was i well know was bestowed on them not so much for any positive merit as because they were considered buds of hope and promises of better works to come the critics of that day the most flattering equally with the severest concurred in objecting to them obscurity a general turgidness of diction and a profusion of new coined double epithets the first is the fault which a writer is the least able to detect in his own compositions and my mind was not then sufficiently disciplined to receive the authority of others as a substitute for my own conviction satisfied that the thoughts such as they were could not have been expressed otherwise or at least more perspicuously i forgot to inquire whether the thoughts themselves did not demand a degree of attention unsuitable to the nature and objects of poetry this remark however applies chiefly though not exclusively to the religious musings the remainder of the charge i admitted to its full extent and not without sincere acknowledgments both to my private and public censors for their friendly admonitions in the after editions i pruned the double epithets with no sparing hand and used my best efforts to tame the swell and glitter both of thought and diction though in truth these parasite plants of youthful poetry had insinuated themselves into my longer poems with such intricacy of union that i was often obliged to omit disentangling the weed from the fear of snapping the flower from that period to the date of the present work i have published nothing with my name which could by any possibility have come before the board of anonymous criticism even the three or four poems printed with the works of a friend as far as they were censured at all were charged with the same or similar defects though i am persuaded not with equal justice with an excess of ornament in addition to strained and elaborate diction i must be permitted to add that even at the early period of my juvenile poems i saw and admitted the superiority of an austerer and more natural style with an insight not less clear than i at present possess my judgment was stronger than were my powers of realizing its dictates and the faults of my language though indeed partly owing to a wrong choice of subjects and the desire of giving a poetic colouring to abstract and metaphysical truths in which a new world then seemed to open upon me did yet in part likewise originate in unfeigned diffidence of my own comparative talent during several years of my youth and early manhood i reverenced those who had reintroduced the manly simplicity of the greek and of our own elder poets with such enthusiasm as made the hope seem presumptuous of writing successfully in the same style perhaps a similar process has happened to others but my earliest poems were marked by an ease and simplicity which i have studied perhaps with inferior success to impress on my later compositions at school christ hospital i enjoyed the inestimable advantage of a very sensible though at the same time a very severe master the rev james bowyer 
he early moulded my taste to the preference of demosthenes to cicero of homer and theocritus to virgil and again of virgil to ovid he habituated me to compare lucretius in such extracts as i then read terence and above all the chaster poems of catullus not only with the roman poets of the so-called silver and brazen ages but with even those of the augustan era and on grounds of plain sense and universal logic to see and assert the superiority of the former in the truth and nativeness both of their thoughts and diction at the same time that we were studying the greek tragic poets he made us read shakespeare and milton as lessons and they were the lessons too which required most time and trouble to bring up so as to escape his censure i learned from him that poetry even that of the loftiest and seemingly that of the wildest odes had a logic of its own as severe as that of science and more difficult because more subtle more complex and dependent on more and more fugitive causes in the truly great poets he would say there is a reason assignable not only for every word but for the position of every word and i well remember that availing himself of the synonyms to the homer of didymus he made us attempt to show with regard to each why it would not have answered the same purpose and wherein consisted the peculiar fitness of the word in the original text in our own english compositions at least for the last three years of our school education he showed no mercy to phrase metaphor or image unsupported by a sound sense or where the same sense might have been conveyed with equal force and dignity in plainer words lute harp and lyre muse muses and inspirations pegasus parnassus and hippocrene were all an abomination to him in fancy i can almost hear him now exclaiming harp harp lyre pen and ink boy you mean muse boy muse your nurse's daughter you mean pure in spring oh ay the cloister pump i suppose nay certain introductions similes and examples were placed by name on a list of interdiction among the similes there was i remember that of the manchineal fruit as suiting equally well with too many subjects in which however it yielded the palm at once to the example of alexander and clytus which was equally good and apt whatever might be the theme was it ambition alexander and clytus flattery alexander and clytus anger drunkenness pride friendship ingratitude late repentance still still alexander and clytus at length the praises of agriculture having been exemplified in the sagacious observation that had alexander been holding the plough he would not have run his friend clytus through with a spear this tried and serviceable old friend was banished by public edict in saecula saeculorum i have sometimes ventured to think that a list of this kind or an index expurgat i have sometimes ventured to think that a list of this kind or an index expurgatorius of certain well-known and ever-returning phrases both introductory and transitional including a large assortment of modest egoisms and flattering illaisms and the like might be hung up in our law courts and both houses of parliament with great advantage to the public as an important saving of national time an incalculable relief to his majesty's ministers but above all as ensuring the thanks of country attorneys and their clients who have private bills to carry through the house be this as it may there was one custom of our masters which i cannot pass over in silence because i think it imitable and worthy of imitation he would often permit our exercises under some pretext of want of time to accumulate till each lad had four or five to be looked over then placing the whole number abreast on his desk he would ask the writer why this or that sentence might not have found as appropriate a place under this or that other thesis and if no satisfying answer could be returned and two faults of the same kind were found in one exercise the irrevocable verdict followed the exercise was torn up and another on the same subject to be produced in addition to the task of the day the reader will i trust excuse this tribute of recollection to a man whose severities even now not seldom furnish the dreams by which the blind fancy would fain interpret to the mind the painful sensations of distempered sleep but neither lessen nor dim the deep sense of my moral and intellectual obligations he sent us to the university excellent latin and greek scholars and tolerable hebrists yet our classical knowledge was the least of the good gifts which we derive from his zealous and conscientious tutorage he is now gone to his final reward full of years and full of honours even of those honours which were dearest to his heart as gratefully bestowed by that school and still binding him to the interests of that school in which he had been himself educated and to which during his whole life he was a dedicated thing from causes which this is not the place to investigate no models of past times however perfect can have the same vivid effect on the youthful mind 
as the productions of contemporary genius the discipline my mind had undergone ne fallereto rotundo sono et versum cursu cincinis et floribus sed ut inspicere quidnam subeset quae sedes quod firmamentum quis fundus verbis and figures essent mera ornatura et orationis fucus vel sanguinis e materiae ipsius corde effluentis rubo quidam nativus et incalescentia genuina removed all obstacles to the appreciation of excellence in style without diminishing my delight that i was thus prepared for the perusal of mr bowles's sonnets and earlier poems at once increased their influence and my enthusiasm the great works of past ages seem to a young man things of another race in respect to which his faculties must remain passive and submiss even as to the stars and mountains but the writings of a contemporary perhaps not many years older than himself surrounded by the same circumstances and disciplined by the same manners possess a reality for him and inspire an actual friendship as of a man for a man his very admiration is the wind which fans and feeds his hope the poems themselves assume the properties of flesh and blood to recite to extol to contend for them is but the payment of a debt due to one who exists to receive it there are indeed modes of teaching which have produced and are producing youths of a very different stamp modes of teaching in comparison with which we have been called on to despise our great public schools and universities in whose halls are hung armoury of the invincible knights of old modes by which children are to be metamorphosed into prodigies and prodigies with a vengeance have i known thus produced prodigies of self-conceit shallowness arrogance and infidelity instead of storing the memory during the period when the memory is the predominant faculty with facts for the after exercise of the judgment and instead of awakening by the noblest models the fond and unmixed love and admiration which is the natural and graceful temper of early youth these nurslings of improved pedagogy are taught to dispute and decide to suspect all but their own and their lecturer's wisdom and to hold nothing sacred from their contempt but their own contemptible arrogance boy graduates in all the technicals and in all the dirty passions and impudence of anonymous criticism to such dispositions alone can the admonition of pliny be requisite neque enim debet operibus eus obesse quod vivit ansi inter eos quos nunquam vidimus floriset non solum libros eus verum etiam imagines conquireremus eustem nunc honor presentis et gratia quasi satietate languescet et hoc pravum malignumque est non admirari hominem admiratione dignissimum quia videre complecti nec laudare tantum verum etiam amare contingit i had just entered on my seventeenth year when the sonnets of mr bowles twenty in number and just then published in a quarto pamphlet were first made known and presented to me by a schoolfellow who had quitted us for the university and who during the whole time that he was in our first form or in our school language a grecian had been my patron and protector i refer to dr middleton the truly learned and every way excellent bishop of calcutta qui laudibus amplis ingenium celebrari meum calamumque solebat calca agens animo validum non omnia terra or bruta vivit amor vivit dolor ora negatu dulcia conspicere ad fieri et meminisse relictum est it was a double pleasure to me and still remains a tender recollection that i should have received from a friend so revered the first knowledge of a poet by whose works year after year i was so enthusiastically delighted and inspired my earliest acquaintances will not have forgotten the undisciplined eagerness and impetuous zeal with which i laboured to make proselytes not only of my companions but of all with whom i conversed of whatever rank and in whatever place as my school finances did not permit me to purchase copies i made within less than a year and a half more than forty transcriptions as the best presents i could offer to those who had in any way won my regard and with almost equal delight did i receive the three or four following publications of the same author though i have seen and known enough of mankind to be well aware that i shall perhaps stand alone in my creed and that it will be well if i subject myself to no worse charge than that of singularity i am not therefore deterred from avowing that i regard and ever have regarded the obligations of intellect among the most sacred of the claims of gratitude a valuable thought or a particular train of thoughts gives me additional pleasure when i can safely refer and attribute it to the conversation or correspondence of another my obligations to mr bowles were indeed important and for radical good at a very premature age even before my fifteenth year i had bewildered myself in metaphysics and in theological controversy 
nothing else pleased me history and particular facts lost all interest in my mind poetry though for a schoolboy of that age i was above par in english versification and had already produced two or three compositions which i may venture to say without reference to my age were somewhat above mediocrity and which had gained me more credit than the sound good sense of my old master was at all pleased with poetry itself yea novels and romances became insipid to me in my friendless wanderings on our leave days for i was an orphan and had scarcely any connections in london highly was i delighted if any passenger especially if he were dressed in black would enter into conversation with me for i soon found the means of directing it to my favourite subjects of providence foreknowledge will and fate fixed fate free will foreknowledge absolute and found no end in wandering mazes lost this preposterous pursuit was beyond doubt injurious both to my natural powers and to the progress of my education it would perhaps have been destructive had it been continued but from this i was auspiciously withdrawn partly indeed by an accidental introduction to an amiable family chiefly however by the genial influence of a style of poetry so tender and yet so manly so natural and real and yet so dignified and harmonious as the sonnets and other early poems of mr bowles well would it have been for me perhaps had i never relapsed into the same mental disease if i had continued to pluck the flower and reap the harvest from the cultivated surface instead of delving in the unwholesome quicksilver mines of metaphysic law and if in after time i have sought a refuge from bodily pain and mismanaged sensibility in abstruse researches which exercise the strength and subtlety of the understanding without awakening the feelings of the heart still there was a long and blessed interval during which my natural faculties were allowed to expand and my original tendencies to develop themselves my fancy and the love of nature and the sense of beauty in forms and sounds the second advantage which i owe to my early perusal and admiration of these poems to which let me add though known to me at a somewhat later period the Lewston hill of mr crow bears more immediately on my present subject among those with whom i conversed there were of course very many who had formed their taste and their notions of poetry from the writings of pope and his followers or to speak more generally in that school of french poetry condensed and invigorated by english understanding which had predominated from the last century i was not blind to the merits of this school yet as from inexperience of the world and consequent want of sympathy with the general subjects of these poems they gave me little pleasure i doubtless undervalued the kind and with the presumption of youth withheld from its masters the legitimate name of poets i saw that the excellence of this kind consisted in just and acute observations on men and manners in an artificial state of society as its matter and substance and in the logic of wit conveyed in smooth and strong epigrammatic couplets as its form that even when the subject was addressed to the fancy or the intellect as in the rape of the lock or the essay on man nay when it was a consecutive narration as in that astonishing product of matchless talent and ingenuity pope's translation of the iliad still a point was looked for at the end of each second line and the whole was as it were a sorites or if i may exchange a logical for a grammatical metaphor a conjunction disjunctive of epigrams meantime the matter and diction seemed to me characterized not so much by poetic thoughts as by thoughts translated into the language of poetry on this last point i had occasion to render my own thoughts gradually more and more plain to myself by frequent amicable disputes concerning darwin's botanic garden which for some years was greatly extolled not only by the reading public in general but even by those whose genius and natural robustness of understanding enable them afterwards to act foremost in dissipating these painted mists that occasionally rise from the marshes at the foot of parnassus during my first cambridge vacation i assisted a friend in a contribution for a literary society in devonshire and in this i remember to have compared darwin's work to the russian palace of ice glittering cold and transitory in the same essay too i assigned sundry reasons chiefly drawn from a comparison of passages in the latin poets with the original greek from which they were borrowed for the preference of collins odes to those of gray and of the simile in shakespeare how like a yonker or a prodigal the scarfed bark puts from her native bay hugged and embraced by the strumpet wind how like the prodigal doth she return with overweathered ribs and ragged sails lean rent and beggared by the strumpet wind merchant of venice act two scene six to the imitation in the bard fair laughs the morn and soft the zephyr blows while proudly riding o'er the azure realm in gallant trim the gilded vessel goes 
youth at the prow and pleasure at the helm regardless of the sweeping whirlwind sway that hushed in grim repose expects its evening prey in which by the by the words realm and sway are rhymes dearly purchased i preferred the original on the ground that in the imitation it depended wholly on the compositor's putting or not putting a small capital both in this and in many other passages of the same poet whether the words should be personifications or mere abstractions i mention this because in referring various lines in grey to the original in shakespeare and milton and in the clear perception how completely all the propriety was lost in the transfer i was at that early period led to a conjecture which many years afterwards was recalled to me from the same thoughts having been started in conversation but far more ably and developed more fully by mr wordsworth namely that this style of poetry which i have characterised above as translations of prose thoughts into poetic language had been kept up by if it did not wholly arise from the custom of writing latin verses and the great importance attached to these exercises in our public schools whatever might have been the case in the fifteenth century when the use of the latin tongue was so general among learned men that erasmus is said to have forgotten his native language yet in the present day it is not to be supposed that a youth can think in latin or that he can have any other reliance on the force or fitness of his phrases but the authority of the writer from whom he has adopted them consequently he must first prepare his thoughts and then pick out from virgil horace ovid or perhaps more compendiously from his greatest halves and quarters of lines in which to embody them i never object to a certain degree of disputatiousness in a young man from the age of seventeen to that of four or five-and-twenty provided i find him always arguing on one side of the question the controversies occasioned by my unfeigned zeal for the honour of a favourite contemporary then known to me only by his works were of great advantage in the formation and establishment of my taste and critical opinions in my defence of the lines running into each other instead of closing at each couplet and of natural language neither bookish nor vulgar neither redolent of the lamp nor of the kennel such as i will remember thee instead of the same thought tricked up in the rag-fair finery of thy image on her wing before my fancy's eyes shall memory bring i had continually to adduce the metre and diction of the greek poets from homer to theocritus inclusively and still more of our elder english poets from chaucer to milton nor was this all but as it was my constant reply to authorities brought against me from later poets of great name that no authority could avail in opposition to truth nature logic and the laws of universal grammar actuated too by my former passion for metaphysical investigations i laboured at a solid foundation on which permanently to ground my opinions in the component faculties of the human mind itself and their comparative dignity and importance according to the faculty or source from which the pleasure given by any poem or passage was derived i estimated the merit of such poem or passage as the result of all my reading and meditation i abstracted two critical aphorisms deeming them to comprise the conditions and criteria of poetic style first that not the poem which we have read but that to which we return with the greatest pleasure possesses the genuine power and claims the name of essential poetry secondly that whatever lines can be translated into other words of the same language without diminution of their significance either in sense or association or in any worthy feeling are so far vicious in their diction be it however observed that i excluded from the list of worthy feelings the pleasure derived from mere novelty in the reader and the desire of exciting wonderment at his powers in the author oftentimes since then in pursuing french tragedies i have fancied two marks of admiration at the end of each line as hieroglyphics of the author's own admiration at his own cleverness our genuine admiration of a great poet is a continuous undercurrent of feeling it is everywhere present but seldom anywhere as a separate excitement i was wont boldly to affirm that it would be scarcely more difficult to push a stone out from the pyramids with a bare hand than to alter a word or the position of a word in milton or shakespeare in their most important works at least without making the poet say something else or something worse than he does say one great distinction i appeared to myself to see plainly between even the characteristic faults of our elder poets and the false beauty of the moderns in the former from dun to cowley we find the most fantastic out-of-the-way thoughts but in the most pure and genuine mother english in the latter the most obvious thoughts in language the most fantastic and arbitrary our faulty elder poets sacrificed the passion and passionate flow of poetry to the subtleties of intellect and to the stars of wit the moderns to the glare and glitter of a perpetual yet broken and heterogeneous imagery or rather to an amphibious something made up half of image and half of abstract meaning the one sacrificed the heart to the head the other both heart and head to point and drapery 
the reader must make himself acquainted with the general style of composition that was at that time deemed poetry in order to understand and account for the effect produced on me by the sonnets the monody at matlock and the hope of mr bowles for it is peculiar to original genius to become less and less striking in proportion to its success in improving the taste and judgment of its contemporaries the poems of west indeed had the merit of chaste and manly diction but they were cold and if i may so express it only dead coloured while in the best of wartons there is a stiffness which too often gives them the appearance of imitations from the greek whatever relation therefore of cause or impulse percy's collection of ballads may bear to the most popular poems of the present day yet in a more sustained and elevated style of the then living poets cooper and bowles were to the best of my knowledge the first who combined natural thoughts with natural diction the first to reconcile the heart with the head it is true as i have before mentioned that from diffidence in my own powers i for a short time adopted a laborious and florid diction which i myself deemed if not absolutely vicious yet of very inferior worth gradually however my practice conformed to my better judgment and the compositions of my twenty-fourth and twenty-fifth years for example the shorter blank verse poems the lines which now form the middle and conclusion of the poem entitled the destiny of nations and the tragedy of remorse are not more below my present ideal in respect of the general tissue of the style than those of the latest date their faults were at least a remnant of the former leaven and among the many who have done me the honour of putting my poems in the same class with those of my betters the one or two who have pretended to bring examples of affected simplicity from my volume have been able to adduce but one instance and that out of a copy of verses half ludicrous half splenetic which i intended and had myself characterised as sermoni propiora every reform however necessary will by weak minds be carried to an excess which will itself need reforming the reader will excuse me for noticing that i myself was the first to expose viso honesto the three sins of poetry one or the other of which is the most likely to beset a young writer so long ago as the publication of the second number of the monthly magazine under the name of nehemiah higginbottom i contributed three sonnets the first of which had for its object to excite a good-natured laugh at the spirit of doleful egotism and at the recurrence of favourite phrases with the double defect of being at once trite and licentious the second was on low creeping language and thoughts under the pretence of simplicity the third the phrases of which were borrowed entirely from my own poems on the indiscriminate use of elaborate and swelling language and imagery the reader will find them in the note below and will i trust regard them as reprinted for biographical purposes alone and not for their poetic merits so general at that time and so decided was the opinion concerning the characteristic vices of my style that a celebrated physician now alas no more speaking of me in other respects with his usual kindness to a gentleman who was about to meet me at a dinner-party could not however resist giving him a hint not to mention the house that jack built in my presence for that i was as sore as a boil about that sonnet he not knowing that i was myself the author of it End of chapter one Chapter Two of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter Two. Supposed irritability of men of genius brought to the test of facts, causes and occasions of the charge, its injustice i have often thought that it would be neither uninstructive nor unamusing to analyse and bring forward into distinct consciousness that complex feeling with which readers in general take part against the author in favour of the critic and the readiness with which they apply to all poets the old sarcasm of horace upon the scribblers of his time genus irritabile vatum a debility and dimness of the imaginative power and a consequent necessity of reliance on the immediate impressions of the senses do we know well render the mind liable to superstition and fanaticism having a deficient portion of internal and proper warmth minds of this class seek in the crowd circumfana for a warmth in common which they do not possess singly cold and phlegmatic in their own nature like damp hay they heat and inflame by co acervation or like bees become restless and irritable through the increased temperature of collected multitudes hence the german word for fanaticism such at least was its original import is derived from the swarming of bees namely schwermen schwarmere the passion being in an inverse proportion to the insight that the more vivid as this the less distinct 
anger is the inevitable consequence the absence of all foundation within their own minds for that which they yet believe both true and indispensable to their safety and happiness cannot but produce an uneasy state of feeling an involuntary sense of fear from which nature has no means of rescuing herself but by anger experience informs us that the first defence of weak minds is to recriminate there is no philosopher but sees that rage and fear are one disease though that may burn and this may freeze they are both alike the ache but where the ideas are vivid and there exists an endless power of combining and modifying them the feelings and affections blend more easily and intimately with these ideal creations than with the objects of the senses the mind is affected by thoughts rather than by things and only then feels the requisite interest even for the most important events and accidents when by means of meditation they have passed into thoughts the sanity of the mind is between superstition with fanaticism on the one hand and enthusiasm with indifference and a diseased slowness to action on the other for the conceptions of the mind may be so vivid and adequate as to preclude that impulse to the realising of them which is strongest and most restless in those who possess more than mere talent or the faculty of appropriating and applying the knowledge of others yet still want something of the creative and self-sufficing power of absolute genius for this reason therefore they are men of commanding genius while the former rest content between thought and reality as it were in an intermundium of which their own living spirit supplies the substance and their imagination the ever-varying form the latter must impress their preconceptions on the world without in order to present them back to their own view with the satisfying degree of clearness distinctness and individuality these in tranquil times are formed to exhibit a perfect poem in palace or temple or landscape garden or a tale of romance in canals that join sea with sea or in walls of rock which shouldering back the billows imitate the power and supply the benevolence of nature to sheltered navies or in aqueducts that arching the wide vale from mountain to mountain give a palmyra to the desert but alas in times of tumult they are the men destined to come forth as the shaping spirit of ruin to destroy the wisdom of ages in order to substitute the fancies of a day and to change kings and kingdoms as the wind shifts and shapes the clouds the records of biography seem to confirm this theory the men of the greatest genius as far as we can judge from their own works or from the accounts of their contemporaries appear to have been of calm and tranquil temper in all that related to themselves in the inward assurance of permanent fame they seem to have been either indifferent or resigned with regard to immediate reputation through all the works of chaucer there reigns a cheerfulness a manly hilarity which makes it almost impossible to doubt a correspondent habit of feeling in the author himself shakespeare's evenness and sweetness of temper were almost proverbial in his own age that this did not arise from ignorance of his own comparative greatness we have abundant proof in his sonnets which could scarcely have been known to pope when he asserted that our great bard grew immortal in his own despite epistle to augustus speaking of one whom he had celebrated and contrasting the duration of his works with that of his personal existence shakespeare adds your name from hence immortal life shall have though i once gone to all the world must die the earth can yield me but a common grave when you entombed in men's eyes shall lie your monument shall be my gentle verse which eyes not yet created shall o'erread and tongues to be your being shall rehearse when all the breathers of this world are dead you still shall live such virtue hath my pen where breath most breathes e'en in the mouth of men sonnet eighty one i have taken the first that occurred but shakespeare's readiness to praise his rivals or a plainer and the confidence of his own equality with those whom he deemed most worthy of his praise are alike manifested in another sonnet was it the proud full sail of his great verse bound for the praise of all too precious you that did my ripe thoughts in my brain in hers making their tomb the womb wherein they grew was it his spirit by spirits taught to write above a mortal pitch that struck me dead no neither he nor his compeers by night giving him aid my verse astonished he nor that affable familiar ghost which nightly gulls him with intelligence as victors of my silence cannot boast i was not sick of any fear from thence but when your countenance filled up his line then lacked i matter that enfeebled mine sonnet eighty six in spencer indeed we trace a mind constitutionally tender delicate and in comparison with his three great compeers i had almost said effeminate and this additionally saddened by the unjust persecution of burleigh and the severe calamities which overwhelmed his latter days these causes have diffused over all his compositions a melancholy grace and have drawn forth occasional strains the more pathetic from their gentleness 
but nowhere do we find the least trace of irritability and still less of quarrelsome or affected contempt of his censurers the same calmness and even greater self-possession may be affirmed of milton as far as his poems and poetic character are concerned he reserved his anger for the enemies of religion freedom and his country my mind is not capable of forming a more august conception than arises from the contemplation of this great man in his latter days poor sick old blind slandered persecuted darkness before and dangerous voice behind in an age in which he was as little understood by the party for whom as by that against whom he had contended and among men before whom he strode so far as to dwarf himself by the distance yet still listening to the music of his own thoughts or if additionally cheered yet cheered only by the prophetic faith of two or three solitary individuals he did nevertheless argue not against heaven's hand or will nor bate a jot of heart or hope but still bore up and steered right onward from others only do we derive our knowledge that milton in his latter day had his scorners and detractors and even in his day of youth and hope that he had enemies would have been unknown to us had they not been likewise the enemies of his country i am well aware that in advanced stages of literature when there exist many and excellent models a high degree of talent combined with taste and judgment and employed in works of imagination will acquire for a man the name of a great genius though even that analogon of genius which in certain states of society may even render his writings more popular than the absolute reality could have done would be sought for in vain in the mind and temper of the author himself yet even in instances of this kind a close examination will often detect that the irritability which has been attributed to the author's genius as its cause did really originate in an ill conformation of body obtuse pain or constitutional defect of pleasurable sensation what is charged to the author belongs to the man who would probably have been still more impatient but for the humanizing influences of the very pursuit which yet bears the blame of his irritability how then are we to explain the easy credence generally given to this charge if the charge itself be not as i have endeavoured to show supported by experience this seems to me of no very difficult solution in whatever country literature is widely diffused there will be many who mistake an intense desire to possess the reputation of poetic genius for the actual powers and original tendencies which constitute it but men whose dearest wishes are fixed on objects wholly out of their own power become in all cases more or less impatient and prone to anger besides though it may be paradoxical to assert that a man can know one thing and believe the opposite yet assuredly a vain person may have so habitually indulged the wish and persevered in the attempt to appear what he is not as to become himself one of his own proselytes still as this counterfeit and artificial persuasion must differ even in the person's own feelings from a real sense of inward power what can be more natural than that this difference should betray itself in suspicious and jealous irritability even as the flowery sod which covers a hollow may be often detected by its shaking and trembling but alas the multitude of books and the general diffusion of literature have produced other and more lamentable effects in the world of letters and such as are abundant to explain though by no means to justify the contempt with which the best grounded complaints of injured genius are rejected as frivolous or entertained as matter of merriment in the days of chaucer and gar our language might with due allowance for the imperfections of a simile be compared to a wilderness of vocal reeds from which the favourites only of pan or apollo could construct even the rude syrinx and from this the constructors alone could elicit strains of music but now partly by the labours of successive poets and in part by the more artificial state of society and social intercourse language mechanised as it were into a barrel-organ supplies at once both instrument and tune thus even the deaf may play so as to delight the many sometimes for it is with similes as it is with jests at a wine-table one is sure to suggest another i have attempted to illustrate the present state of our language in its relation to literature by a press-room of larger and smaller stereotype pieces which in the present anglo-gallican fashion of unconnected epigrammatic periods it requires but an ordinary portion of ingenuity to vary indefinitely and yet still produce something which if not sense will be so like it as to do as well perhaps better for it spares the reader the trouble of thinking prevents vacancy while it indulges indolence and secures the memory from all danger of an intellectual plethora hence of all trades literature at present demands the least talent or information and of all modes of literature the manufacturing of poems the difference indeed between these and the works of genius is not less than between an egg and an egg-shell yet at a distance they both look alike now it is no less remarkable than true with how little examination works of polite literature are commonly perused not only by the mass of readers but by men of first-rate ability 
till some accident or chance discussion have roused their attention and put them on their guard and hence individuals below mediocrity not less in natural power than in acquired knowledge nay bunglers who have failed in the lowest mechanic crafts and whose presumption is in due proportion to their want of sense and sensibility men who being first scribblers from idleness and ignorance next become libellers from envy and malevolence have been able to drive a successful trade in the employment of the booksellers nay have raised themselves into temporary name and reputation with the public at large by that most powerful of all adulation the appeal to the bad and malignant passions of mankind but as it is the nature of scorn envy and all malignant propensities to require a quick change of objects such writers are sure sooner or later to awake from their dream of vanity to disappointment and neglect with embittered and envenomed feelings even during their short-lived success sensible in spite of themselves on what a shifting foundation it rests they resent the mere refusal of praise as a robbery and at the justice censures kindle at once into violent and undisciplined abuse till the acute disease changing into chronicle the more deadly as the less violent they become the fit instruments of literary detraction and moral slander they are then no longer to be questioned without exposing the complainant to ridicule because forsooth they are anonymous critics and authorise in andrew marvell's phrase as synodical individuals to speak of themselves plurali majestatico as if literature formed a caste like that of the paris in hindustan who however maltreated must not dare to deem themselves wronged as if that which in all other cases adds a deeper dye to slander the circumstance of its being anonymous here acted only to make the slanderer inviolable thus in part from the accidental tempers of individuals men of undoubted talent but not men of genius tempers rendered yet more irritable by their desire to appear men of genius but still more effectively by the excesses of the mere counterfeits both of talent and genius the number too being so incomparably greater of those who are thought to be than of those who really are men of genius and in part from the natural but not therefore the less partial and unjust distinction made by the public itself between literary and all other property i believe the prejudice to have arisen which considers an unusual irascibility concerning the reception of its products as characteristic of genius it might correct the moral feelings of a numerous class of readers to suppose a review set on foot the object of which should be to criticise all the chief works presented to the public by our ribbon weavers calico printers cabinet makers and china manufacturers which should be conducted in the same spirit and take the same freedom with personal character as our literary journals they would scarcely i think deny their belief not only that the genus irritabile would be found to include many other species besides that of bards but that the irritability of trade would soon reduce the resentments of poets into mere shadow fights in the comparison or is wealth the only rational object of human interest or even if this were admitted has the poet no property in his works or is it a rare or culpable case that he who serves at the altar of the muses should be compelled to derive his maintenance from the altar when too he has perhaps deliberately abandoned the fairest prospects of rank and opulence in order to devote himself an entire and undistracted man to the instruction or refinement of his fellow-citizens or should we pass by all higher objects and motives all disinterested benevolence and even that ambition of lasting praise which is at once the crutch and ornament which at once supports and betrays the infirmity of human virtue is the character and property of the man who labours for our intellectual pleasures less entitled to a share of our fellow-feeling than that of the wine merchant or milliner sensibility indeed both quick and deep is not only a characteristic feature but may be deemed a component part of genius but it is not less an essential mark of true genius that its sensibility is excited by any other cause more powerfully than by its own personal interests for this plain reason that the man of genius lives most in the ideal world in which the present is still constituted by the future or the past and because his feelings have been habitually associated with thoughts and images to the number clearness and vivacity of which the sensation of self is always in an inverse proportion and yet should he perchance have occasion to repel some false charge or to rectify some erroneous censure nothing is more common than for the many to mistake the general liveliness of his manner and language whatever is the subject for the effects of peculiar irritation from its accidental relation to himself for myself if from my own feelings or from the less suspicious test of the observations of others i had been made aware of any literary testiness or jealousy i trust that i should have been however neither silly nor arrogant enough to have burthened the imperfection on genius but an experience and i should not need documents in abundance to prove my words if i added a tried experience of twenty years has taught me that the original sin of my character consists in a callous indifference to public opinion and to the attacks of those who influence it that praise and admiration have become yearly less and less desirable except as marks of sympathy 
nay that it is difficult and distressing to me to think with any interest even about the sale and profit of my works important as in my present circumstances such considerations must needs be yet it never occurred to me to believe or fancy that the quantum of intellectual power bestowed on me by nature or education was in any way connected with this habit of my feelings or that it needed any other parents or fosterers than constitutional indolence aggravated into languor by ill health the accumulating embarrassments of procrastination the mental cowardice which is the inseparable companion of procrastination and which makes us anxious to think and converse on anything rather than on what concerns ourselves in fine all those close vexations whether chargeable on my faults or my fortunes which leave me but little grief to spare for evils comparatively distant and alien indignation at literary wrongs i leave to men born under happier stars i cannot afford it but so far from condemning those who can i deem it a writer's duty and think it creditable to his heart to feel and express a resentment proportioned to the grossness of the provocation and the importance of the object there is no profession on earth which requires an attention so early so long or so unintermitting as that of poetry and indeed as that of literary composition in general if it be such as at all satisfies the demands both of taste and of sound logic how difficult and delicate a task even the mere mechanism of verses may be conjectured from the failure of those who have attempted poetry late in life where then a man has from his earliest youth devoted his whole being to an object which by the admission of all civilized nations in all ages is honourable as a pursuit and glorious as an attainment what of all that relates to himself and his family if only we accept his moral character can have fairer claims to his protection or more authorised acts of self-defence than the elaborate products of his intellect and intellectual industry prudence itself would command us to show even if defect or diversion of natural sensibility had prevented us from feeling a due interest and qualified anxiety for the offspring and representatives of our nobler being i know it alas by woeful experience i have laid too many eggs in the hot sands of this wilderness the world with ostrich carelessness and ostrich oblivion the greater part indeed have been trod under foot and are forgotten but yet no small number have crept forth into life some to furnish feathers for the caps of others and still more to plume the shafts in the quivers of my enemies of them that unprovoked have lain in wait against my soul sic vos non vobis melificatis apes end of chapter two chapter three of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter three the author's obligations to critics and the probable occasion principles of modern criticism mr southey's works and character to anonymous critics in reviews magazines and news journals of various name and rank and to satirists with or without a name in verse or prose or in verse text aided by prose comment i do seriously believe and profess that i owe full two-thirds of whatever reputation and publicity i happen to possess for when the name of an individual has occurred so frequently in so many works for so great a length of time the readers of these works which with a shelf or two of beauties elegant extracts and annas form nine-tenths of the reading of the reading public cannot but be familiar with the name without distinctly remembering whether it was introduced for eulogy or for censure and this becomes the more likely if as i believe the habit of perusing periodical works may be properly added to averroes catalogue of anti-mnemonics or weakness of the memory but where this has not been the case yet the reader will be apt to suspect that there must be something more than usually strong and extensive in a reputation that could either require or stand so merciless and long-continued a cannonading without any feeling of anger therefore for which indeed on my own account i have no pretext i may yet be allowed to express some degree of surprise that after having run the critical gauntlet for a certain class of faults which i had nothing having come before the judgment seat in the interim i should year after year quarter after quarter month after month not to mention sundry petty periodicals of still quicker revolution or weekly or diurnal have been for at least seventeen years consecutively dragged forth by them into the foremost ranks of the proscribed and forced to abide the brunt of abuse for faults directly opposite and which i certainly had not how shall i explain this whatever may have been the case with others i certainly cannot attribute this persecution to personal dislike or to envy or to feelings of vindictive animosity 
not to the former for with the exception of a very few who are my intimate friends and were so before they were known as authors i have had little other acquaintance with literary characters than what may be implied in an accidental introduction or casual meeting in a mixed company and as far as words and looks can be trusted i must believe that even in these instances i had excited no unfriendly disposition neither by letter nor in conversation have i ever had dispute or controversy beyond the common social interchange of opinions nay where i had reason to suppose my convictions fundamentally different it has been my habit and i may add the impulse of my nature to assign the grounds of my belief rather than the belief itself and not to express dissent till i could establish some points of complete sympathy some grounds common to both sides from which to commence its explanation still less can i place these attacks to the charge of envy the few pages which i have published are of too distant a date and the extent of their sale a proof too conclusive against their having been popular at any time to render probable i had almost said possible the excitement of envy on their account and the man who should envy me on any other verily he must be envy mad lastly with as little semblance of reason could i suspect any animosity towards me from vindictive feelings as the cause i have before said that my acquaintance with literary men has been limited and distant and that i have had neither dispute nor controversy from my first entrance into life i have with few and short intervals lived either abroad or in retirement my different essays on subjects of national interest published at different times first in the morning post and then in the courier with my courses of lectures on the principles of criticism as applied to shakespeare and milton constitute my whole publicity the only occasions on which i could offend any member of the republic of letters with one solitary exception in which my words were first misstated and then wantonly applied to an individual i could never learn that i had excited the displeasure of any among my literary contemporaries having announced my intention to give a course of lectures on the characteristic merits and defects of english poetry in its different eras first from chaucer to milton second from dryden inclusively to thomson and third from cooper to the present day i changed my plan and confined my disquisition to the former two periods that i might furnish no possible pretext for the unthinking to misconstrue or the malignant to misapply my words and having stamped their own meaning on them to pass them as current coin in the marts of garrulity or detraction praises of the unworthy are felt by ardent minds as robberies of the deserving and it is too true and too frequent that bacon harrington machiavel and spinoza are not read because hume condillac and voltaire are but in promiscuous company no prudent man will appugn the merits of a contemporary in his own supposed department contenting himself with praising in his turn those whom he deems excellent if i should ever deem it my duty at all to oppose the pretensions of individuals i would oppose them in books which could be weighed and answered in which i could evolve the whole of my reasons and feelings with their requisite limits and modifications not in irrecoverable conversation where however strong the reasons might be the feelings that prompted them would assuredly be attributed by some one or other to envy and discontent besides i well know and i trust have acted on that knowledge that it must be the ignorant and injudicious who extol the unworthy and the eulogies of critics without taste or judgment are the natural reward of authors without feeling or genius sint uniquique sua premia how then dismissing as i do these three causes am i to account for attacks the long continuance and inveteracy of which it would require all three to explain the solution seems to be this i was in habits of intimacy with mr wordsworth and mr southey this however transfers rather than removes the difficulty be it that by an unconscionable extension of the old adage noscito a socio my literary friends are never under the waterfall of criticism but i must be wet through with the spray yet how came the torrent to descend upon them first then with regard to mr southey i well remember the general reception of his earlier publications namely the poems published with mr lovell under the names of moscus and bion the two volumes of poems under his own name and the joan of arc the censures of the critics by profession are extant and may be easily referred to callous lines inequality in the merit of the different poems and in the lighter works a predilection for the strange and whimsical in short such faults as might have been anticipated in a young and rapid writer were indeed sufficiently enforced nor was there at that time wanting a party spirit to aggravate the defects of a poet who with all the courage of uncorrupted youth had avowed his zeal for a cause which he deemed that of liberty and his abhorrence of oppression by whatever name consecrated but it was as little objected by others as dreamed of by the poet himself that he preferred careless and prosaic lines on rule and of forethought or indeed that he pretended to any other art or theory of poetic diction 
except that which we may all learn from Horace, Quinctilian, the admirable dialogue, De Oratoribus, generally attributed to Tacitus, or Strada's prelusions, if indeed natural good sense and the early study of the best models in his own language had not infused the same maxims more securely, and, if I may venture the expression, more vitally. All that could have been fairly deduced was that in his taste and estimation of writers, Mr. Southey agreed far more with Thomas Wharton than with Dr. Johnson. Nor do I mean to deny that at all times Mr. Southey was of the same mind with Sir Philip Sidney, in preferring an excellent ballad in the humblest style of poetry to twenty indifferent poems that strutted in the highest. And by what have his works, published since then, been characterised, each more strikingly than the preceding, but by greater splendour, a deeper pathos, profounder reflections, and a more sustained dignity of language and of metre? Distant may the period be, but whenever the time shall come, when all his works shall be collected by some editor worthy to be his biographer, I trust that an appendix of excerpta of all the passages in which his writings, name and character have been attacked, from the pamphlets and periodical works of the last twenty years, may be an accompaniment. Yet that it would prove medicinal in after times I dare not hope, for as long as there are readers to be delighted with calumny, there will be found reviewers to calumniate, and such readers will become in all probability more numerous, in proportion as a still greater diffusion of literature shall produce an increase of skeolists and skeolism bring with it petulance and presumption in times of old books were as religious oracles as literature advanced they next became venerable preceptors they then descended to the rank of instructive friends and as their numbers increased they sank still lower to that of entertaining companions and at present they seem degraded into culprits to hold up their hands at the bar of every self-elected yet not the less peremptory judge who chooses to write from humour or interest from enmity or arrogance and to abide the decision of him that reads in malice or him that reads after dinner the same retrograde movement may be traced in the relation which the authors themselves have assumed towards their readers from the lofty address of bacon these are the meditations of francis of verulam which that posterity should be possessed of he deemed their interest or from dedication to monarch or pontiff in which the honour given was asserted in equipoise to the patronage acknowledged from pindar's ep alloi si d'alloi megaloi to descaton cori fotai basilensi maiceti paptaini portion ai se te tuton upso chronon patein eme te tosade nicaphorois homilein profanton sophian cath elanas eonta panta olymp ode one there was a gradual sinking in the etiquette or allowed style of pretension poets and philosophers rendered diffident by their very number addressed themselves to learned readers then aimed to conciliate the graces of the candid reader till the critic still rising as the author sank the amateurs of literature collectively were erected into a municipality of judges and addressed as the town and now finally all men being supposed able to read and all readers able to judge the multitudinous public shaped into personal unity by the magic of abstraction sits nominal despot on the throne of criticism but alas as in other despotisms it but echoes the decisions of its invisible ministers whose intellectual claims to the guardianship of the muses seem for the greater part analogous to the physical qualifications which adapt their oriental brethren for the superintendence of the harem thus it is said that st nepomuke was installed the guardian of bridges because he had fallen over one and sunk out of sight thus too st cecilia is said to have been first propitiated by musicians because having failed in her own attempts she had taken a dislike to the art and all its successful professors but i shall probably have occasion hereafter to deliver my convictions more at large concerning this state of things and its influences on taste genius and morality in the thalaba the madoc and still more evidently in the unique cid in the kahama and as last so best the roderick southey has given abundant proof se cogitare quam sit magnum dare aliquid immanus hominum nec persuadere sibi posse non saepe tractandum quod placere et semper et omnibus cupiat but on the other hand i conceive that mr southey was quite unable to comprehend wherein could consist the crime or mischief of printing half a dozen or more playful poems or to speak more generally compositions which would be enjoyed or passed over according as the taste and humour of the reader might chance to be provided they contain nothing immoral 
in the present age perituri parcere chartae is emphatically an unreasonable demand the merest trifle he ever sent abroad had tenfold better claims to its ink and paper than all the silly criticisms on it which proved no more than that the critic was not one of those for whom the trifle was written and than all the grave exhortations to a greater reverence for the public as if the passive page of a book by having an epigram or doggerel tale impressed on it instantly assumed at once locomotive power and a sort of ubiquity so as to flutter and buzz in the ear of the public to the sore annoyance of the said mysterious personage but what gives an additional and more ludicrous absurdity to these lamentations is the curious fact that if in a volume of poetry the critic should find poem or passage which he deems more especially worthless he is sure to select and reprint it in the review by which on his own grounds he wastes as much more paper than the author as the copies of a fashionable review are more numerous than those of the original book in some and those the most prominent instances as ten thousand to five hundred i know nothing that surpasses the vileness of deciding on the merits of a poet or painter not by characteristic defects for where there is genius these always point to his characteristic beauties but by accidental failures or faulty passages except the impudence of defending it as the proper duty and most instructive part of criticism omit or pass lightly over the expression grace and grouping of raphael's figures but ridicule in detail the knitting-needles and broom-twigs that are to represent trees in his backgrounds and never let him hear the last of his gallipots admit that the allegro and penserosa of milton are not without merit but repay yourself for this concession by reprinting at length the two poems on the university carrier as a fair specimen of his sonnets quote, a book was writ of late called tetracordon and as characteristic of his rhythm and metre cite his literal translation of the first and second psalm in order to justify yourself you need only assert that had you dwelt chiefly on the beauties and excellencies of the poet the admiration of these might seduce the attention of future writers from the objects of their love and wonder to an imitation of the few poems and passages in which the poet was most unlike himself but till reviews are conducted on far other principles and with far other motives till in the place of arbitrary dictation and petulant sneers the reviewers support their decisions by reference to fixed canons of criticism previously established and deduced from the nature of man reflecting minds will pronounce it arrogance in them thus to announce themselves to men of letters as the guides of their taste and judgment to the purchaser and mere reader it is at all events an injustice he who tells me that there are defects in a new work tells me nothing which i should not have taken for granted without his information but he who points out and elucidates the beauties of an original work does indeed give me interesting information such as experience would not have authorized me in anticipating and as to compositions which the authors themselves announce with haec ipsi novimus esse nihil why should we judge by a different rule two printed works only because the one author is alive and the other in his grave what literary man has not regretted the prudery of spratt in refusing to let his friend cowley appear in his slippers and dressing-gown i am not perhaps the only one who has derived an innocent amusement from the riddles conundrums trisyllable lines and the like of swift and his correspondents in hours of languor when to have read his more finished works would have been useless to myself and in some sort an act of injustice to the author but i am at a loss to conceive by what perversity of judgment these relaxations of his genius could be employed to diminish his fame as the writer of gulliver or the tale of a tub had mr southey written twice as many poems of inferior merit or partial interest as have enlivened the journals of the day they would have added to his honour with good and wise men not merely or principally as proving the versatility of his talents but as evidences of the purity of that mind which even in its levities never dictated a line which it need regret on any moral account i have in imagination transferred to the future biographer the duty of contrasting southey's fixed and well-earned fame with the abuse and indefatigable hostility of his anonymous critics from his early youth to his ripest manhood but i cannot think so ill of human nature as not to believe that these critics have already taken shame to themselves whether they consider the object of their abuse in his moral or his literary character for reflect but on the variety and extent of his acquirements he stands second to no man either as an historian or as a bibliographer and when i regard him as a popular essayist for the articles of his compositions in the reviews are for the greater part essays on subjects of deep or curious interest rather than criticisms on particular works i look in vain for any writer who has conveyed so much information from so many and such recondite sources with so many just and original reflections in a style so lively and poignant yet so uniformly classical and perspicuous 
no one in short who has combined so much wisdom with so much wit so much truth and knowledge with so much life and fancy his prose is always intelligible and always entertaining in poetry he has attempted almost every species of composition known before and he has added new ones and if we accept the highest lyric in which how few how very few even of the greatest minds have been fortunate he has attempted every species successfully from the political song of the day thrown off in the playful overflow of honest joy and patriotic exultation to the wild ballad from epistolary ease and graceful narrative to austere and impetuous moral declamation from the pastoral charms and wild streaming lights of the thalaba in which sentiment and imagery have given permanence even to the excitement of curiosity and from the full blaze of the kahama a gallery of finished pictures and one splendid fancy piece in which notwithstanding the moral grandeur rises gradually above the brilliance of the colouring and the boldness and novelty of the machinery to the more sober beauties of the maddock and lastly from the maddock to his roderick in which retaining all his former excellencies of a poet eminently inventive and picturesque he has surpassed himself in language and metre in the construction of the whole and in the splendour of particular passages here then shall i conclude no the characters of the deceased like the encomia on tombstones as they are described with religious tenderness so are they read with allowing sympathy indeed but yet with rational deduction there are men who deserve a higher record men with whose characters it is the interest of their contemporaries no less than that of posterity to be made acquainted while it is yet possible for impartial censure and even for quick-sighted envy to cross-examine the tale without offence to the courtesies of humanity and while the eulogist detected in exaggeration of falsehood must pay the full penalty of his baseness in the contempt which brands the convicted flatterer publicly has mr southey been reviled by men who as i would fain hope for the honour of human nature hurled firebrands against a figure of their own imagination publicly have his talents been depreciated his principles denounced as publicly do i therefore who have known him intimately deem it my duty to leave recorded that it is southey's almost unexampled felicity to possess the best gifts of talent and genius free from all their characteristic defects to those who remember the state of our public schools and universities some twenty years past it will appear no ordinary praise in any man to have passed from innocence into virtue not only free from all vicious habit but unstained by one act of intemperance or the degradations akin to intemperance that scheme of head heart and habitual demeanour which in his early manhood and first controversial writings milton claiming the privilege of self-defence asserts of himself and challenges his calumniators to disprove this will his schoolmates his fellow collegians and his maturer friends with a confidence proportioned to the intimacy of their knowledge bear witness to as again realised in the life of robert southey but still more striking to those who by biography or by their own experience are familiar with the general habits of genius will appear the poet's matchless industry and perseverance in his pursuits the worthiness and dignity of those pursuits his generous submission to tasks of transitory interest or such as his genius alone could make otherwise and that having thus more than satisfied the claims of affection or prudence he should yet have made for himself time and power to achieve more and in more various departments than almost any other writer has done though employed wholly on subjects of his own choice and ambition but as that he possesses and is not possessed by his genius even so is he master even of his virtues the regular and methodical tenor of his daily labours which would be deemed rare in the most mechanical pursuits and might be envied by the mere man of business loses all semblance of formality in the dignified simplicity of his manners in the spring and healthful cheerfulness of his spirits always employed his friends find him always at leisure no less punctual in trifles than steadfast in the performance of highest duties he inflicts none of those small pains and discomforts which irregular men scatter about them and which in the aggregate so often become formidable obstacles both to happiness and utility while on the contrary he bestows all the pleasures and inspires all that ease of mind on those around him or connected with him which perfect consistency and if such a word might be framed absolute reliability equally in small as in great concerns cannot but inspire and bestow when this too is softened without being weakened by kindness and gentleness i know few men who so well deserve the character which an ancient attributes to marcus cato namely that he was likest virtue inasmuch as he seemed to act aright not in obedience to any law or outward motive but by the necessity of a happy nature which could not act otherwise as son brother husband father master friend he moves with firm yet light steps alike unostentatious and alike exemplary as a writer he has uniformly made his talent subservient 
to the best interests of humanity, of public virtue and domestic piety. His cause has ever been the cause of pure religion and of liberty, of national independence and of national illumination. When future critics shall weigh out his guerdon of praise and censure, it will be Southey the poet only that will supply them with the scanty materials for the latter. They will likewise not fail to record that as no man was ever a more constant friend, never had poet more friends and honourers among the good of all parties, and that quacks in education, quacks in politics, and quacks in criticism were his only enemies. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter Four. The Lyrical Ballads with the Preface. Mr. Wordsworth's Earlier Poems. On Fancy and Imagination. The Investigation of the Distinction Important to the Fine Arts. I have wandered far from the object in view, but as I fancied to myself readers who would respect the feelings that had tempted me from the main road, so I dare calculate on not a few who will warmly sympathise with them. At present it will be sufficient for my purpose, if I have proved, that Mr. Southey's writings no more than my own, furnish the original occasion to this fiction of a new school of poetry, and to the clamours against its supposed founders and proselytes. As little do I believe that Mr. Wordsworth's lyrical ballads were in themselves the cause, I speak exclusively of the two volumes so entitled. A careful and repeated examination of these confirms me in the belief that the omission of less than a hundred lines would have precluded nine-tenths of the criticism on this work. I hazard this declaration, however, on the supposition that the reader has taken it up, as he would have done any other collection of poems purporting to derive their subjects or interests from the incidents of domestic or ordinary life, intermingled with higher strains of meditation which the poet utters in his own person and character with the proviso that these poems were perused without knowledge of, or reference to, the author's peculiar opinions, and that the reader had not had his attention previously directed to those peculiarities. In that case, as actually happened with Mr. Southey's earlier works, the lines and passages which might have offended the general taste would have been considered as mere inequalities, and attributed to inattention, not to perversity of judgment. The men of business who had passed their lives chiefly in cities, and who might therefore be expected to derive the highest pleasure from acute notices of men and manners conveyed in easy yet correct and pointed language and all those who reading but little poetry are most stimulated with that species of it which seems most distant from prose would probably have passed by the volumes altogether others more catholic in their taste and yet habituated to be most pleased when most excited would have contented themselves with deciding that the author had been successful in proportion to the elevation of his style and subject not a few, perhaps, might, by the admiration of the lines written near Tintern Abbey, on revisiting the Wye, those left upon a yew-tree seat, the old Cumberland beggar and Ruth, have been gradually led to peruse with kindred feeling the brothers, the Hartleap Well, and whatever other poems in that collection may be described as holding a middle place between those written in the highest and those in the humblest style, as, for instance, between the Tintern Abbey and the Thorn or Simon Lee should their taste submit to no further change and still remain unreconciled to the colloquial phrases or the imitations of them that are more or less scattered through the class last mentioned yet even from the small number of the latter they would have deemed them but an inconsiderable subtraction from the merit of the whole work or what is sometimes not unpleasing in the publication of a new writer as serving to ascertain the natural tendency and consequently the proper direction of the author's genius in the critical remarks therefore prefixed and annexed to the lyrical ballads i believe we may safely rest as the true origin of the unexampled opposition which mr wordsworth's writings have been since doomed to encounter the humbler passages in the poems themselves were dwelt on and cited to justify the rejection of the theory what in and for themselves would have been either forgotten or forgiven as imperfections or at least comparative failures provoked direct hostility when announced as intentional as the result of choice after full deliberation thus the poems admitted by all as excellent joined with those which had pleased the far greater number though they formed two-thirds of the whole work instead of being deemed as in all right they should have been even if we take for granted that the reader judged aright an atonement for the few exceptions gave wind and fuel to the animosity against both the poems and the poet in all perplexity there is a portion of fear which predisposes the mind to anger not able to deny that the author possessed both genius and a powerful intellect they felt very positive but yet were not quite certain that he might not be in the right, and they themselves in the wrong. 
an unquiet state of mind, which seeks alleviation by quarrelling with the occasion of it, and by wondering at the perverseness of the man, who had written a long and argumentative essay to persuade them that fair is foul, and foul is fair, in other words, that they had been all their lives admiring without judgment, and were now about to censure without reason. That this conjecture is not wide from the mark, I am induced to believe from the noticeable fact, which I can state on my own knowledge, that the same general censure has been grounded by almost every different person on some different poem. Among those whose candour and judgment I estimate highly, I distinctly remember six who expressed their objections to the lyrical ballads, almost in the same words, and altogether to the same purport, at the same time admitting that several of the poems had given them great pleasure, and strange as it might seem, the composition which one cited as execrable, another quoted as his favourite. I am indeed convinced in my own mind that could the same experiment have been tried with these volumes, as was made in the well-known story of the picture, the result would have been the same. The parts which had been covered by black spots on the one day would be found equally albo lapide notate on the succeeding. However this may be, it was assuredly hard and unjust to fix the attention on a few separate and insulated poems with as much aversion as if there had been so many plague spots on the whole work, instead of passing them over in silence as so much blank paper or leaves of a bookseller's catalogue, especially as no one pretended to have found in them any immorality or indelicacy, and the poems therefore at the worst could only be regarded as so many light or inferior coins in a rouleau of gold, not as so much alloy in a weight of bullion. A friend whose talents I hold in the highest respect, but whose judgment and strong sound sense I have had almost continued occasion to revere, making the usual complaints to me concerning both the style and subjects of Mr. Wordsworth's minor poems, I admitted that there were some few of the tales and incidents in which I could not myself find a sufficient cause for their having been recorded in metre. I mentioned Alice Fell as an instance. Nay, replied my friend, with more than usual quickness of manner, I cannot agree with you there. That, I own, does seem to me a remarkably pleasing poem. In the lyrical ballads, for my experience does not enable me to extend the remark equally unqualified to the two subsequent volumes, I have heard at different times and from different individuals every single poem extolled and reprobated, with the exception of those of loftier kind, which, as was before observed, seem to have won universal praise. This fact of itself would have made me different in my censures, had not a still stronger ground been furnished by the strange contrast of the heat and long continuance of the opposition, with the nature of the fault stated as justifying it. The seductive faults, the dulcia vitia of Cowley, Marine, or Darwin, might reasonably be thought capable of corrupting the public judgment for half a century, and require a twenty years' war, campaign after campaign, in order to dethrone the usurper and re-establish the legitimate taste, but that a downright simpleness, under the affectation of simplicity, prosaic words in feeble metre, silly thoughts in childish phrases, and a preference of mean, degrading, or at best trivial associations and characters, should succeed in forming a school of imitators, a company of almost religious admirers, and this too among young men of ardent minds, liberal education, and not, with academic laurels unbestowed, and that this bare and bald counterfeit of poetry which is characterised as below criticism should for nearly twenty years have well-nigh engrossed criticism as the main if not the only but of review magazine pamphlet poem and paragraph this is indeed matter of wonder of yet greater is it that the contest should still continue as undecided as that between bacchus and the frogs in aristophanes when the former descended to the realms of the departed to bring back the spirit of old and genuine poesy c h coax coax d al exulois auto coax au lingar est au hai coax oimizet uga moi malei c h ala main ke craxum mesta g opossum hai pharynx an hemon candanae di himeris brikakex coax coax d tuto ga unicae sete c h ode men hema supantos d ode men humeis ke dai em odipote ke craxomai ga can me dei de hymeras eos en humon epicrateso to coax c h brickacax coax coax during the last year of my residence at cambridge seventeen ninety four i became acquainted with mr wordsworth's first publication entitled descriptive sketches and seldom if ever was the emergence of an original poetic genius above the literary horizon more evidently announced in the form style and manner of the whole poem and in the structure of the particular lines and periods there is a harshness and acerbity connected and combined with words and images all aglow, which might recall those products of the vegetable world, where gorgeous blossoms rise out of a hard and thorny rind and shell, within which the rich fruit is elaborating. The language is not only peculiar and strong, but at times knotty and contorted, as by its own impatient strength, 
while the novelty and struggling crowd of images acting in conjunction with the difficulties of the style demands always a greater closeness of attention than poetry at all events than descriptive poetry has a right to claim it not seldom therefore justified the complaint of obscurity in the following extract i have sometimes fancied that i saw an emblem of the poem itself and of the author's genius as it was then displayed tis storm and hid in mist from hour to hour all day the floods a deepening murmur pour the sky is veiled and every cheerful sight dark is the region as with coming night yet what a sudden burst of overpowering light triumphant on the bosom of the storm glances the fire-clad eagle's wheeling form eastward in long perspective glittering shine the wood-crowned cliffs that o'er the lake recline those eastern cliffs a hundred streams unfold at once to pillars turn that flame with gold behind his sail the peasant strives to shun the west that burns like one dilated sun where in a mighty crucible expire the mountains glowing hot like coals of fire the poetic psyche in its process to full development undergoes as many changes as its greek namesake the butterfly and it is remarkable how soon genius clears and purifies itself from the faults and errors of its earliest products faults which in its earliest compositions are the more obtrusive and confluent because as heterogeneous elements which had only a temporary use they constitute the very ferment by which themselves are carried off or we may compare them to some diseases which must work on the humours and be thrown out on the surface in order to secure the patient from their future recurrence i was in my twenty-fourth year when i had the happiness of knowing mr wordsworth personally and while memory lasts i shall hardly forget the sudden effect produced on my mind by his recitation of a manuscript poem which still remains unpublished but of which the stanza and tone of style were the same as those of the female vagrant as originally printed in the first volume of the lyrical ballads there was here no mark of strained thought or forced diction no crowd or turbulence of imagery and as the poet hath himself well described in his lines on revisiting the why manly reflection and human associations had given both variety and an additional interest to natural objects which in the passion and appetite of the first love they had seemed to him neither to need nor permit the occasional obscurities which had risen from an imperfect control over the resources of his native language had almost wholly disappeared together with that worst defect of arbitrary and illogical phrases at once hackneyed and fantastic which holds so distinguished a place in the technique of ordinary poetry and will more or less alloy the earlier poems of the truest genius unless the attention has been specially directed to their worthlessness and incongruity i did not perceive anything particular in the mere style of the poem alluded to during its recitation except indeed such difference as was not separable from the thought and manner and the spenserian stanza which always more or less recalls to the reader's mind spencer's own style would doubtless have authorised in my then opinion a more frequent descent to the phrases of ordinary life than could without an ill effect have been hazarded in the heroic couplet it was not however the freedom from false taste whether as to common defects or to those more properly his own which made so unusual an impression on my feelings immediately and subsequently on my judgment it was the union of deep feeling with profound thought the fine balance of truth in observing with the imaginative faculty in modifying the objects observed and above all the original gift of spreading the tone the atmosphere and with it the depth and height of the ideal world around forms incidents and situations of which for the common view custom had bedimmed all the lustre had dried up the sparkle and the dewdrops this excellence which in all mr wordsworth's writings is more or less predominant and which constitutes the character of his mind i no sooner felt than i sought to understand repeated meditations led me first to suspect and a more intimate analysis of the human faculties the appropriate marks functions and effects matured my conjecture into full conviction that fancy and imagination were two distinct and widely different faculties instead of being according to the general belief either two names with one meaning or at furthest the lower and higher degree of one and the same power it is not i own easy to conceive a more apposite translation of the greek phantasia than the latin imaginatio but it is equally true that in all societies there exists an instinct of growth a certain collective unconscious good sense working progressively to desynonymize those words originally of the same meaning which the conflux of dialects supplied to the more homogeneous languages as the greek and german and which the same cause joined with accidents of translation from original works of different countries occasion in mixed languages like our own the first and most important point to be proved is that two conceptions perfectly distinct are confused under one and the same word and this done to appropriate that word exclusively to the one meaning and the synonym should there be one to the other but if as will be often the case in the arts and sciences no synonym exists 
we must either invent or borrow a word in the present instance the appropriation has already begun and been legitimated in the derivative adjective milton had a highly imaginative cowley a very fanciful mind if therefore i should succeed in establishing the actual existence of two faculties generally different the nomenclature would be at once determined to the faculty by which i had characterized milton we should confine the term imagination while the other would be contradistinguished as fancy now were it once fully ascertained that this division is no less grounded in nature than that of delirium from mania or otway's lutes laurel seas of milk and ships of amber from shakespeare's what have his daughters brought him to this pass or from the preceding apostrophe to the elements the theory of the fine arts and of poetry in particular could not but derive some additional and important light it would in its immediate effects furnish a torch of guidance to the philosophical critic and ultimately to the poet himself in energetic minds truth soon changes by domestication into power and from directing in the discrimination and appraisal of the product becomes influensive in the production to admire on principle is the only way to imitate without loss of originality it has been already hinted that metaphysics and psychology have long been my hobby-horse but to have a hobby-horse and to be vain of it are so commonly found together that they pass almost for the same i trust therefore that there will be more good humour than contempt in the smile with which the reader chastises my self-complacency if i confess myself uncertain whether the satisfaction from the perception of a truth new to myself may not have been rendered more poignant by the conceit that it would be equally so to the public there was a time certainly in which i took some little credit to myself in the belief that i had been the first of my countrymen who had pointed out the diverse meaning of which the two terms were capable and analysed the faculties to which they should be appropriated mr w taylor's recent volume of synonyms i have not yet seen but his specification of the terms in question has been clearly shown to be both insufficient and erroneous by mr wordsworth in the preface added to the late collection of his poems the explanation which mr wordsworth has himself given will be found to differ from mine chiefly perhaps as our objects are different it could scarcely indeed happen otherwise from the advantage i have enjoyed of frequent conversation with him on a subject to which a poem of his own first directed my attention and my conclusions concerning which he had made more lucid to myself by many happy instances drawn from the operation of natural objects on the mind but it was mr wordsworth's purpose to consider the influences of fancy and imagination as they are manifested in poetry and from the different effects to conclude their diversity in kind while it is my object to investigate the seminal principle and then from the kind to deduce the degree my friend has drawn a masterly sketch of the branches with their poetic fruitage i wish to add the trunk and even the roots as far as they lift themselves above ground and are visible to the naked eye of our common consciousness yet even in this attempt i am aware that i shall be obliged to draw more largely on the reader's attention than so immethodical a miscellany as this can authorize when in such a work the ecclesiastical polity of such a mind as hooker's the judicious author though no less admirable for the perspicuity than for the port and dignity of his language and though he wrote for men of learning in a learned age saw nevertheless occasion to anticipate and guard against complaints of obscurity as often as he was to trace his subject to the highest wellspring and fountain which continues he because men are not accustomed to the pains we take are more needful a great deal than acceptable and the matters we handle seem by reason of newness till the mind grow better acquainted with them dark and intricate i would gladly therefore spare both myself and others this labour if i knew how without it to present an intelligible statement of my poetic creed not as my opinions which weigh for nothing but as deductions from established premises conveyed in such a form as is calculated either to effect a fundamental conviction or to receive a fundamental confutation if i may dare once more adopt the words of hooker they unto whom we shall seem tedious are in no wise injured by us because it is in their own hands to spare that labour which they are not willing to endure those at least let me be permitted to add who have taken so much pains to render me ridiculous for a perversion of taste and have supported the charge by attributing strange notions to me on no other authority than their own conjectures owe it to themselves as well as to me not to refuse their attention to my own statement of the theory which i do acknowledge or shrink from the trouble of examining the grounds on which i rest it or the arguments which i offer in its justification End of chapter four chapter five of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter 5. On the Law of Association. Its History Traced from Aristotle to Hartley. There have been men in all ages who have been impelled as by an instinct to propose their own nature as a problem, and who devote their attempts to its solution. The first step was to construct a table of distinctions, which they seem to have formed on the principle of the absence or presence of the will. Our various sensations, perceptions, and movements were classed as active or passive, or as media partaking of both. A still finer distinction was soon established between the voluntary and the spontaneous. In our perceptions we seem to ourselves merely passive to an external power, whether as a mirror reflecting the landscape, or as a blank canvas on which some unknown hand paints it. For it is worthy of notice that the latter, or the system of idealism, may be traced to sources equally remote with the former, or materialism, and Barclay can boast an ancestry at least as venerable as Gassendi or Hobbes. These conjectures, however, concerning the mode in which our perceptions originated, could not alter the natural difference of things and thoughts. In the former the cause appeared wholly external, while in the latter sometimes our will interfered as the producing or determining cause, and sometimes our nature seemed to act by a mechanism of its own, without any conscious effort of the will, or even against it. Our inward experiences were thus arranged in three separate classes. The passive sense, or what the schoolmen called the merely receptive quality of the mind, the voluntary, and the spontaneous, which holds the middle place between both. But it is not in human nature to meditate on any mode of action, without inquiring after the law that governs it, and in the explanation of the spontaneous movements of our being, the metaphysician took the lead of the anatomist and natural philosopher. In Egypt, Palestine, Greece, and India, the analysis of the mind had reached its noon and manhood, while experimental research was still in its dawn and infancy. For many, very many centuries, it has been difficult to advance a new truth, or even a new error, in the philosophy of the intellect or morals. With regard, however, to the laws that direct the spontaneous movements of thought, and the principle of the intellectual mechanism there exists, it has been asserted, an important exception most honourable to the moderns, and in the merit of which our own country claims the largest share. Sir James Mackintosh, who amid the variety of his talents and attainments, is not of less repute for the depth and accuracy of his philosophical inquiries, than for the eloquence with which he is said to render their most difficult results perspicuous and the driest attractive, affirmed in the lectures delivered by him in Lincoln's Inn Hall, that the law of association, as established in the contemporaneity of the original impressions, formed the basis of all true psychology, and that any ontological or metaphysical science, not contained in such, that is, an empirical psychology, was but a web of abstractions and generalizations. Of this prolific truth, of this great fundamental law, he declared Hobbes to have been the original discoverer, while its full application to the whole intellectual system we owe to Hartley, who stood in the same relation to Hobbes as Newton to Kepler, the law of association being that to the mind, which gravitation is to matter. Of the former clause in this assertion, as it respects the comparative merits of the ancient metaphysicians, including their commentators, the schoolmen, and of the modern and British and French philosophers from Hobbes to Hume, Hartley, and Condillac, this is not the place to speak. So wide indeed is the chasm between Sir James Mackintosh's philosophical creed and mine, that so far from being able to join hands, we could scarcely make our voices intelligible to each other, and to bridge it over would require more time, skill, and power than I believe myself to possess. But the latter clause involves for the greater part a mere question of fact and history, and the accuracy of the statement is to be tried by documents rather than reasoning. First, then, I deny Hobbes's claim in toto, for he had been anticipated by Descartes, whose work De Methodo preceded Hobbes's De Natura Humana by more than a year. But what is of much more importance, Hobbes builds nothing on the principle which he had announced. He does not even announce it, as differing in any respect from the general laws of material motion and impact, nor was it indeed possible for him so to do, compatibly with his system, which was exclusively material and mechanical. Far otherwise is it with Descartes, greatly as he too in his after writings, and still more egregiously his followers de la Forge and others, obscured the truth by their attempts to explain it on the theory of nervous fluids and material configurations. But in his interesting work, De Methodo, Descartes relates a circumstance which first led him to meditate on this subject, 
and which since then has been often noticed and employed as an instance and illustration of the law a child who with its eyes bandaged had lost several of his fingers by amputation continued to complain for many days successively of pains now in this joint and now in that of the very fingers which had been cut off descartes was led by this instant to reflect on the uncertainty with which we attribute any particular place to any inward pain or uneasiness and proceeded after long consideration to establish it as a general law that contemporaneous impressions whether images or sensations recall each other mechanically on this principle as a groundwork he built up the whole system of human language as one continued process of association he showed in what sense not only general terms but generic images under the name of abstract ideas actually existed and in what consist their nature and power as one word may become the general exponent of many so by association a simple image may represent a whole class but in truth hobbes himself makes no claims to any discovery and introduces this law of association or in his own language discursion of mind as an admitted fact in the solution alone of which and this by causes purely physiological he arrogates any originality his system is briefly this whenever the senses are impinged on by external objects whether by the rays of light reflected from them or by effluxes of their finer particles there results a correspondent motion of the innermost and subtlest organs this motion constitutes a representation and there remains an impression of the same or a certain disposition to repeat the same motion whenever we feel several objects at the same time the impressions that are left or in the language of mr hume the ideas are linked together whenever therefore any one of the movements which constitute a complex impression is renewed through the senses the others succeed mechanically it follows of necessity therefore that hobbes as well as hartley and all others who derive association from the connection and interdependence of the supposed matter the movements of which constitute our thoughts must have reduced all its forms to the one law of time but even the merit of announcing this law with philosophic precision cannot be fairly conceded to him for the objects of any two ideas need not have coexisted in the same sensation in order to become mutually associable the same result will follow when one only of the two ideas has been represented by the senses and the other by the memory long however before either hobbes or descartes the law of association had been defined and its important function set forth by ludovicus vives fantasia it is to be noticed is employed by vives to express the mental power of comprehension or the active function of the mind and imaginatio for the receptivity via receptiva of impressions or for the passive perception the power of combination he appropriates to the former quae singula et simpliciter asseperat imaginatio ea conjungit et disjungate fantasia and the law by which the thoughts are spontaneously presented follows thus quae simul sunt a fantasia comprehensa si alterutrum occurat solet secum alterum representare to time therefore he subordinates all the other exciting causes of association the soul proceeds a causa ad effectum ab hoc ad instrumentum a parte ad totum thence to the place from place to person and from this to whatever preceded or followed all as being parts of a total impression each of which may recall the other the apparent springs saltus vel transitus etiam longissimos he explains by the same thought having been a component part of two or more total impressions thus ex scipione venio in cogitationem potentiae turcicae propter victorius eus de asia in qua regnabat antiochus but from vives i pass at once to the source of his doctrines and as far as we can judge from the remains yet extant of greek philosophy as to the first so to the fullest and most perfect enunciation of the associative principle namely to the writings of aristotle and of these in particular to the treatises de anima and de memoria which last belongs to the series of essays entitled in the old translation parva naturalia inasmuch as later writers have either deviated from or added to his doctrines they appear to me to have introduced either error or groundless supposition in the first place it is to be observed that aristotle's positions on this subject are unmixed with fiction the wise stagerite speaks of no successive particles propagating motion like billiard balls as hobbes nor of nervous or animal spirits where inanimate and irrational solids are thawed down and distilled or filtrated by ascension into living and intelligent fluids that etch and re-etch engravings on the brain as the followers of descartes and the humoral pathologists in general nor of an oscillating ether which was to effect the same service for the nerves of the brain considered as solid fibres as the animal spirits perform for them under the notion of hollow tubes as hartley teaches nor finally with yet more recent dreamers of chemical compositions by elective affinity 
or of an electric light at once the immediate object and the ultimate organ of inward vision which rises to the brain like an aurora borealis and there disporting in various shapes as the balance of plus and minus or negative and positive is destroyed or re-established images out both past and present aristotle delivers a just theory without pretending to an hypothesis or in other words a comprehensive survey of the different facts and of their relations to each other without supposition that is a fact placed under a number of facts as their common support and explanation though in the majority of instances these hypotheses or suppositions better deserve the name of upopoesis or suffixions he uses indeed the word kinesis to express what we call representations or ideas but he carefully distinguishes them from material motion designating the latter always by annexing the words entopo or katatopon on the contrary in his treatise de anima he excludes place and motion from all the operations of thought whether representations or volitions as attributes utterly and absurdly heterogeneous the general law of association or more accurately the common condition under which all exciting causes act and in which they may be generalized according to aristotle is this ideas by having been together acquire a power of recalling each other or every partial representation awakes the total representation of which it had been a part in the practical determination of this common principle to particular recollections he admits five agents or occasioning causes first connection in time whether simultaneous preceding or successive second vicinity or connection in space third interdependence or necessary connection as cause and effect fourth likeness and fifth contrast as an additional solution of the occasional seeming chasms in the continuity of reproduction he proves that movements or ideas possessing one or the other of these five characters had passed through the mind as intermediate links sufficiently clear to recall other parts of the same total impressions with which they had coexisted though not vivid enough to excite that degree of attention which is requisite for distinct recollection or as we may aptly express it after consciousness in association then consists the whole mechanism of the reproduction of impressions in the aristotelian psychology it is the universal law of the passive fancy and mechanical memory that which supplies to all other faculties their objects to all thought the elements of its materials in consulting the excellent commentary of st thomas aquinas on the parva naturalia of aristotle i was struck at once with its close resemblance to hume's essay on association the main thoughts were the same in both the order of the thoughts was the same and even the illustrations differed only by hume's occasional substitution of more modern examples i mentioned the circumstance to several of my literary acquaintances who admitted the closeness of the resemblance and that it seemed too great to be explained by mere coincidence but they thought it improbable that hume should have held the pages of the angelic doctor worth turning over but some time after mr payne showed sir james mackintosh some odd volumes of st thomas aquinas partly perhaps from having heard that he had in his lectures passed a high encomium on this canonized philosopher but chiefly from the fact that the volumes had belonged to mr hume and had here and there marginal marks and notes of reference in his own handwriting among these volumes was that which contains the parva naturalia in the old latin version swathed and swaddled in the commentary aforementioned it remains then for me first to state wherein hartley differs from aristotle then to exhibit the grounds of my conviction that he differed only to err and next as a result to show by what influences of the choice and judgment the associative power becomes either memory or fancy and in conclusion to appropriate the remaining offices of the mind to the reason and the imagination with my best efforts to be as perspicuous as the nature of language will permit on such a subject i earnestly solicit the good wishes and friendly patience of my readers while I thus go sounding on my dim and perilous way. End of chapter 5chapter 6 of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter 6 that hartley system as far as it differs from that of aristotle is neither tenable in theory nor founded in facts of hartley's hypothetical vibrations in his hypothetical oscillating ether of the nerves which is the first and most obvious distinction between his system and that of aristotle i shall say little this with all other similar attempts to render that an object of the sight which has no relation to sight has been already sufficiently exposed by the younger Romarus, Maas, and others, as outraging the very axioms of mechanics in a scheme, the merit of which consists in its being mechanical. Whether any other philosophy be possible but the mechanical, and again, whether the mechanical system can have any claim to be called philosophy, 
are questions for another place. It is, however, certain, that as long as we deny the former and affirm the latter, we must bewilder ourselves whenever we would pierce into the adita of causation, and all that laborious conjecture can do is to fill up the gaps of fancy. Under that despotism of the eye, the emancipation from which Pythagoras by his numeral and Plato by his musical symbols, and both by geometric discipline aimed at, as the first proper duma of the mind, under this strong sensuous influence we are restless, because invisible things are not the objects of vision, and metaphysical systems for the most part become popular not for their truth, but in proportion as they attribute to causes a susceptibility of being seen, if only our visual organs were sufficiently powerful. From a hundred possible confutations let one suffice. According to this system, the idea or vibration, lowercase a, from the external object, uppercase a, becomes associable with the idea or vibration, lowercase m, from the external object, uppercase m, because the oscillation, lowercase a, propagated itself so as to reproduce the oscillation, lowercase m. But the original impression from uppercase m was essentially different from the impression, uppercase a, unless therefore different causes may produce the same effect, the vibration lowercase a could never produce the vibration lowercase m, and this therefore could never be the means by which lowercase a and lowercase m are associated. To understand this, the attentive reader need only be reminded that the ideas are themselves in Hartley's system nothing more than their appropriate configurative vibrations. It is a mere delusion of the fancy to conceive the pre-existence of the ideas in any chain of association, as so many differently coloured billiard balls in contact, so that when an object, the billiard stick, strikes the first or white ball, the same motion propagates itself through the red, green, blue, and black, and sets the whole in motion. No! We must suppose the very same force, which constitutes the white ball, to constitute the red or black, or the idea of a circle to constitute the idea of a triangle, which is impossible. But it may be said that by the sensations from the objects uppercase A and uppercase M, the nerves have acquired a disposition to the vibrations lowercase a and lowercase m, and therefore lowercase a need only be repeated in order to reproduce lowercase m. Now we will grant for a moment the possibility of such a disposition in a material nerve, which yet seems scarcely less absurd than to say that a weathercock had acquired a habit of turning to the east from the wind having been so long in that quarter. For if it be replied that we must take in the circumstance of life, what then becomes of the mechanical philosophy? And what is the nerve but the flint which the wag placed in the pot as the first ingredient of his stone broth, requiring only salt, turnips, and mutton for the remainder? But if we waive this, and presuppose the actual existence of such a disposition, two cases are possible. Either every idea has its own nerve and correspondent oscillation, or this is not the case. If the latter be the truth, we should gain nothing by these dispositions, for then, every nerve having several dispositions, when the motion of any other nerve is propagated into it, there will be no ground or cause present why exactly the oscillation lowercase m should arise rather than any other to which it was equally predisposed but if we take the former and let every idea have a nerve of its own then every nerve must be capable of propagating its motion into many other nerves and again there is no reason assignable why the vibration lowercase m should arise rather than any other ad libitum it is fashionable to smile at hartley's vibrations and vibrationcles and his work has been re-edited by priestley with the omission of the material hypothesis. But Hartley was too great a man, too coherent a thinker, for this to have been done either consistently or to any wise purpose. For all other parts of his system, as far as they are peculiar to that system, once removed from their mechanical basis, not only lose their main support, but the very motive which led to their adoption. Thus the principle of contemporaneity, which Aristotle had made the common condition of all the laws of association, Hartley was constrained to represent as being itself the sole law. For to what law can the action of material atoms be subject but that of proximity in place? And to what law can the emotions be subjected but that of time? Again, from this results inevitably that the will, the reason, the judgment, and the understanding, instead of being the determining causes of association, must needs be represented as its creatures, and among its mechanical effects. Conceive, for instance, a broad stream winding through a mountainous country, with an indefinite number of currents, bearing and running into each other according as the gusts chance to blow from the opening of the mountains. The temporary union of several currents in one so as to form the main current of the moment would present an accurate image of Hartley's theory of the will. Had this been really the case, the consequence would have been that our whole life would be divided between the despotism of outward impressions and that of senseless and passive memory. Take his law in its highest abstraction and most philosophical form, namely, 
that every partial representation recalls the total representation of which it was a part and the law becomes nugatory were it only for its universality in practice it would indeed be mere lawlessness consider how immense must be the sphere of a total impression from the top of st paul's church and how rapid and continuous a series of such total impressions if therefore we suppose the absence of all interference of the will reason and judgment one or other of two consequences must result either the ideas or relics of such impression will exactly imitate the order of the impression itself which would be absolute delirium or any one part of that impression might recall any other part and as from the law of continuity there must exist in every total impression some one or more parts which are components of some other following total impression and so on ad infinitum any part of any impression might recall any part of any other without a cause present to determine what it should be for to bring in the will or reason as causes of their own cause that is as at once causes and effects can satisfy those only who in their pretended evidences of a god having first demanded organization as the sole cause and ground of intellect will then coolly demand the pre-existence of intellect as the cause and groundwork of organization there is in truth but one state to which this theory applies at all namely that of complete light-headedness and even to this it applies but partially because the will and reason are perhaps never wholly suspended a case of this kind occurred in a roman catholic town in germany a year or two before my arrival at Göttingen, and had not then ceased to be a frequent subject of conversation a young woman of four or five-and-twenty who could neither read nor write was seized with a nervous fever during which according to the asseverations of all the priests and monks of the neighbourhood she became possessed and as it appeared by a very learned devil she continued incessantly talking latin greek and hebrew in very pompous tones and with most distinct enunciation this possession was rendered more probable by the known fact that she was or had been a heretic voltaire humorously advises the devil to decline all acquaintance with medical men and it would have been more to his reputation if he had taken this advice in the present instance the case had attracted the particular attention of a young physician and by his statement many eminent physiologists and psychologists visited the town and cross-examined the case on the spot sheets full of her ravings were taken down from her own mouth and were found to consist of sentences coherent and intelligible each for itself but with little or no connection with each other of the hebrew a small portion only could be traced to the bible the remainder seemed to be in the rabbinical dialect all trick or conspiracy was out of the question not only had the young woman ever been a harmless simple creature but she was evidently labouring under a nervous fever in the town in which she had been resident for many years as a servant in different families no solution presented itself the young physician however determined to trace her past life step by step for the patient herself was incapable of returning a rational answer he at length succeeded in discovering the place where her parents had lived travelled thither found them dead but an uncle surviving and from him learned that the patient had been charitably taken by an old protestant pastor at nine years old and had remained with him some years even till the old man's death of this pastor the uncle knew nothing but that he was a very good man with great difficulty and after much search our young medical philosopher discovered a niece of the pastor's who had lived with him as his housekeeper and had inherited his effects she remembered the girl related that her venerable uncle had been too indulgent and could not bear to hear the girl scolded that she was willing to have kept her but that after her patron's death the girl herself refused to stay anxious inquiries were then of course made concerning the pastor's habits and the solution of the phenomenon was soon obtained for it appeared that it had been the old man's custom for years to walk up and down a passage of his house into which the kitchen door opened and to read to himself with a loud voice out of his favourite books a considerable number of these were still in the niece's possession she added that he was a very learned man and a great hebraist among the books were found a collection of rabbinical writings together with several of the greek and latin fathers and the physician succeeded in identifying so many passages with those taken down at the young woman's bedside that no doubt could remain in any rational mind concerning the true origin of the impressions made on her nervous system this authenticated case furnishes both proof and instance that relics of sensation may exist for an indefinite time in a latent state in the very same order in which they were originally impressed and as we cannot rationally suppose the feverish state of the brain to act in any other way than as a stimulus this fact and it would not be difficult to adduce several of the same kind contributes to make it even probable that all thoughts are in themselves imperishable and that if the intelligent faculty should be rendered more comprehensive it would require only a different and apportioned organization the body celestial instead of the body terrestrial to bring before every human soul the collective experience of its whole past existence and this this perchance is the dread book of judgment 
in the mysterious hieroglyphics of which every idle word is recorded yea in the very nature of a living spirit it may be more possible that heaven and earth should pass away than that a single act a single thought should be loosened or lost from that living chain of causes with all the links of which conscious or unconscious the free will our only absolute self is co-extensive and co-present but not now dare i longer discourse of this waiting for a loftier mood and a nobler subject worn from within and from without that it is profanation to speak of these mysteries tois maide phantastesin os kalon to tais dikeo sines kai sophro sines prosopon kai ute hespros ute eos ute kala to ga horum pros to horomenon syngenes kai homoion poesemenon de epibalein te thea uga ampopote eden ophthalmos helion helio edis me geganomenos ude tu kalon and ide psyche me kage genomine to those to whose imagination it has never been presented how beautiful is the countenance of justice and wisdom and that neither the morning nor the evening star are so fair for in order to direct the viewer right it behoves that the beholder should have made himself congenerous and similar to the object beheld never could the eye have beheld the sun had not its own essence been soliform i e preconfigured to light by a similarity of essence with that of light neither can a soul not beautiful attain to an intuition of beauty End of chapter six